Hi, one of the things that we hear a lot about uh, when it comes to uh, marketing of our agriculture commodities these days is the influence of outside market influences. Today I want to spend a little bit of time talking about or trying to shed a little bit of light on just what some of those things are or why they might be a little bit important. I'm Dr. Darrell Mark. I'm a professor of economics here at South Dakota State University and a market analyst for iGrow.org for South Dakota State University and Extension. So let's dive into this subject a little bit and try to learn a few things here about what's happening uh, in the uh, market relative to these outside market influences. You know, ba back when I went to college and, and even the first years I started teaching marketing in universities, we typically tended to think mostly about some of the traditional things that influence market. Just about all of them being very fundamental supply and demand types of factors. For example, on the supply side, we'd think about production numbers, we'd think about acres or the bushel per acre uh, type of figures. We'd talk about on the livestock side, carcass weights or how many livestock slaughter um, we're, we're looking at for a particular week or month. Or maybe um, for either kind of commodities, grain or livestock, how much uh, is being imported into the United States. The typical supply things that we think about. And then on the demand side, we think about uh, whatever use number there, there are available to us. In particular, we pay a lot of attention to export markets. The United States exports a fair amount of our agricultural commodities. Um, so we also look at um, what the consumption is domestically, and that's going to depend on what the commodity is. For example, for corn, we're going to think about the next users being livestock um, and poultry numbers. Um, we're going to talk about industrial uses for corn, like ethanol, what kind of uh, demand sources there are there um, for cattle or, or pork. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, how many people there are in the United States, um, what the per capita consumption is, what their disposable income is, what their consumer tastes and preferences are. Those are kind of the traditional market influences that we think about, but now all of a sudden you hear a lot of things when you're listening to the radio or you're uh, reading information on igro.org or what have you that says, well, market in, outside market influences uh, were the main driver in the corn market today. So let's talk a little bit about what some of those are and, and why that might be in, uh, important. Now, I've kind of listed here several things that, that might be considered under this category of outside market influences. And, uh, and I'm just going to show you a few examples uh, of some of these types of things here too. One of them is related commodities, related either in production or in consumption. Uh, and I'll show you a good example of that in com combination with the energy market, um, we are much more tied to the energy market in agriculture than we probably ever have been in the past, partly because we're using both corn and soybeans to produce energy, but um, the fertilizers and, and other inputs that we use uh, in, are very uh, heavily reliant on the energy market, both in natural gas and in uh, crude oil and, and, um, and even gasoline for transportation. So those are important uh, markets that we look to that are kind of outside that typical supply and demand set of fundamentals that we talk about. And another big one is the currency market. World currencies markets or the foreign exchange market is a very big influencer of the uh, price of commodities anymore because like I said, we do export uh, a fair amount of commodities out of the United States. So the currency market along with other leading economic indicators uh, and social trends both tend to have an impact on markets. I'm going to try to give some examples of all these things as well as other things that are happening in the world in terms of the political situation, economic conditions, and other instability, even wars um, and, uh, and other um, um, uh, issues like that, trade regulations, trade sanctions, all have an impact on uh, agricultural markets as well as natural disasters. Now, in the case of several of these, it's not necessarily either that we're going to see these things manifested, in other words, that they're going to actually come to fruition, but just the threat of some of these things happening are enough to drive our market prices either higher or lower, depending on what the, uh, what the actual market outside influence is. The reason these things, like I said, are, are having more of an influence on our markets anymore, there, there's a number of reasons. One of them that we maybe don't think about very much anymore, unless you spend a lot of time watching maybe cable news where there's always a 24-hour news cycle, is that we have a nearly instantaneous communication system around the world. The markets trade nearly 24 hours a day. Most of our ag commodity markets trade 23 hours a day. And as a result, they're constantly having the opportunity to react and in some cases maybe overreact a little bit, trying to find where that equilibrium uh, quantity supplied, quantity demand is at, where that supply and demand curve intersect. And it's being fed huge volumes of information gathered from around the globe. And, uh, and that has a, a big impact on trying to find 
um, that, that balance between supply and demand and where that equilibrium price and quantity actually are. So we, we have a very interconnected world and as a result we're being influenced by things that we probably never noticed the influence from very much in the past. The other thing that I think is more and more uh, um, prevalent in today's market is that as producers, as processors, we tend to think more about what the end use of our commodity is going to be and that tends to uh, that tends to drive us to look farther beyond our farm gate so to speak at the things that are influencing our bu the buyers of our commodities and what they're going to end up doing with those commodities, whether it's a corn producer growing a different uh, variety of corn for, say, an ethanol plant versus a livestock feeder, or maybe it's uh, a difference um, in the type of beef uh, a rancher might be raising for um, maybe an all-natural market versus a conventional market. There's, there's a variety of different uh, market influences in that respect, too, that we focus on more, and as a result, we bring more information in that we probably didn't used to in the market. Let's just take a look at a few quick examples here. Um, the, the graph that I'm showing on this, uh, this particular slide uh, has the corn market and the crude oil market and ethanol futures on there. These are all very related markets. Um, maybe didn't used to be quite so much. Corn and crude are related in insofar that uh, crude oil prices are, are a good measure of energy price uh, levels and as such um, they're related in, in terms of uh, crude oil and, and natural gas, both being um, inputs into the corn production process. And so there tends to be a relationship there that, you, that uh, is prevalent there as well. Um, Higher, uh, higher energy prices, higher input prices tends to lead to um, smaller, um, smaller corn production and, and so consequently uh, higher prices uh, for, for corn prices. And so typically you do see some, um, some inverse relationship from that perspective. However, it's actually in, in more recent years been dwarfed and they tend to trade more in a, um, in a positive way, in other words, corn and crude oil going up and down together, and it's due to the influence of ethanol. Ethanol, of course, is a substitute to some degree for crude oil, in, in other words, gasoline, and, um, and, and as a result, you see the ethanol and, and uh, crude oil market trading more or less in uh, up and down fashion together, and the relationship between corn and ethanol um, is of course very strong as uh, higher ethanol prices will tend to allow ethanol producers to bid up the price of corn. So there tends to be um, a positive correlation between all three of them because of corn's linkage to ethanol and ethanol's linkage to the crude oil market. Much more intertwined than it ever used to be. Like I said, currency is a big influencer as well in the, in the uh, export markets um, for U.S. commodities. So now let's come back and look at the currency market. I mentioned earlier it's having such a big influence uh, because we export a lot of commodities. The value of the U.S. dollar relative to other world currencies tends to affect the relative price of exports and imports because foreign buyers have to convert their, their um, monetary currency into U.S. dollars in order, in order to purchase U.S. products. So when you see a high U.S. dollar, it gives them more purchasing it gives the United States more purchasing power on the world market to buy imports because we have a high dollar we can buy more of another country's currency for the same amount of dollars and that gives us the chance to realize cheaper imports. Conversely a high US dollar makes US products more expensive to foreign buyers um, it makes our products more expensive on world markets by and consequently slows our export market marketing down and uh, and make our exports more expensive. You often hear in the agriculture market that the U.S. Uh, tends to favor a low U.S. dollar. The reason is because it makes our exports cheaper to uh, foreign buyers. They can come in and purchase more um, because they're they're using their uh, currency that's relatively higher value to the U.S. dollar to purchase more dollars, which goes farther in terms of buying those, uh, those commodities to import into their country. So a U.S. dollar is, is uh, synonymous, synonymous with um, increased exports uh, from the United States. The key thing to remember here is that the currency market varies by country. It depends on what country you're dealing with and, and uh, to the extent to whether or not it matters in, in uh, certain commodities um, depends on whether or not that country is a major buyer of U.S. commodities. 
oftentimes we try to look at the value of the U.S. dollar in U.S. dollar index futures contracts. These are actually traded on the Intercontinental Exchange in New York. Um, and what I'm showing you in this pie graph is actually the weighted value of what the U.S. dollar index is. And you can see it's nearly 60% um, weighted against the euro dollar, but also by a few other uh, world currencies, um, including the British pound, the Japanese yen, and the Canadian dollar. They're being uh, fairly sizable as well, too. So when we talk about the U.S. dollar being high or low, often we're looking at the U.S. dollar index, which is very relevant because these countries do uh, import a lot of uh, U.S. commodities. But there are several countries that, um, that aren't considered here that might have a relatively um, different relationship to the U.S. dollar in terms of their currency than what the U.S. dollar reflects. So you've got to look at them individually as well as getting an overall picture of where the U.S. dollar index is at. Let me just show you graphic, uh, graphically here why, why this is uh, important and how it relates to the corn market, for example. I'm showing you on one line on this graph the corn futures uh, market going back uh, a number of years and the U.S. dollar index. Essentially what you can see here is that they're inversely related. When the U.S. dollar index tends to be low, corn futures prices tend to be high. When corn futures prices tend to be high, the U.S. dollar tends to be relatively low. Again, the reason for that is when the U.S. dollar is relatively cheap, it makes corn a better value to foreign buyers, and so they come into our market and, and will end up purchasing more corn as a result. Same relationship holds true on soybeans. I'll show you that on this graph. Again, an inverse relationship. A cheaper U.S. dollar tends to make soybean prices go up. And so uh, some days when there doesn't appear to be a lot of uh, fundamental information maybe in the corn and soybean market influencing uh, prices, you might look to see what did the U.S. dollar do today? Did the U.S. dollar drop a lot? Maybe that's what made corn prices or soybean prices go up for the day. Or did the U.S. dollar go up a lot? That might have been responsible for a big drop in the corn and soybean market uh, to some extent. It's even true on the livestock side as well because we export beef, of course, too. Live cattle prices and U.S. dollar uh, are inversely related as well for exactly the same reasons. You can see that on this slide. Like I said, it, it's important, though, to look beyond just what's in the U.S. dollar, what's weighted in there very heavily uh, based on the euro dollar, for example, when it comes to the live cattle market or the cattle market, we don't typically tend to export very much beef to uh, the, Euro the European market. Essentially, we're looking at Japan and Mexico and Canada and South Korea being our top four um, beef export markets, and so it's more important to look at uh, those particular markets. Um, and, and on this particular graph, there's way too many lines on there to really to sift through that. But um, if, you, if you can study them, you can see that there's not very much relationship, for example, between the live cattle market and the euro dollar. Um, but there's a stronger correlation between the Japanese yen and the Canadian dollar to the live cattle futures market here in the United States because those are the ones that represent the export markets for uh, beef here in the United States. One of the other outside market influences that we see um, discussed more and more are a variety of leading economic indicators and the impact that they have on futures market. Essentially things that measure uh, growth in the economy um, it, are, are what I'm talking about here. Um, so oftentimes we as economists measure um, growth or contraction in the economy in terms of the gross domestic product. Um, for example, we, we've uh, heard a lot about recession in the last few years. The recession is really the reason that's relevant to talk about in terms of commodity prices is it reduces consumer disposable income and thus their purchases of relatively higher priced products, especially that might be gasoline, but in the case of uh, agriculture that we're interested in so much, it might be protein. So if consumers are faced with um, a recession and purchasing less protein, not only does that decrease um, the demand for beef and pork and, and poultry, will consequently then back up into the uh, soybean meal market, maybe the corn market, in terms of um, a reduction in demand there from those protein growers, the livestock producers. So we see that uh, influenced in, in terms of the uh, gross domestic product expansion contraction in the, in the um, overall economy, as well as unemployment or underemployment, um, also reducing consumer disposable income in a similar manner. We also see a high correlation between um, the stock market performance and um, commodity markets. 
partly because the stock market uh, is highly correlated with uh, growth and contraction in the overall economy, but also because the stock market offers or is an alternative investment um, to commodity futures. Maybe I should better say it, commodity futures are an alternative investment to equity buyers in the stock market. So there tends to be some, some uh, positive relationship there between the stock market as well. Let me show you a couple of graphs to illustrate some of these points. This particular graph from uh, the Federal Reserve Bank in Kansas City illustrates per capita expenditures on beef, pork, poultry, and milk products, essentially protein products, before and after recessions, actually before, during, and after recessions. The blue bars are uh, per capita expenditures on those um, protein items one year before a recession, which you notice are generally in the six to 10 um, uh, percent uh, change rain or another, uh, in other words, they show increases in the years before recession. During recessions, they typically tend to be relatively short. Um, after the, the percentage growth in, in expenditures. And typically, the expenditures on those items tend to decline in years following the recession. So there's actual data there to illustrate some of the points that I was just suggesting on the previous slide. Here's the relationship, for example, between the stock market here as measured by the Dow Jones Industrial Average and live cattle futures contracts fairly highly correlated for the last oh, four or five years or so. Um, maybe not so much there going back farther in the graph during the big, uh, the big bo the boom in the stock market, but in more recent years you do see a fairly high correlation there because the stock market's measuring the overall health of the economy as well um, as engaging to some extent what consumers might be willing and able to buy in terms of the protein market. Another, uh, another interesting uh, area to look at in terms of outside market influence is the growth in other economies. On the red line on this graph, you see um, China's per capita gross domestic product, which is actually measured on the, um, on the right-hand scale, and China's imports of U.S. products in the blue bars, which are measured on the left-hand scale. And so you can see that as the Chinese economy is growing in terms of its gross domestic product, the imports from the United States tend to grow fairly, uh, fairly lockstep with that and almost exponentially in the last few years. As Chinese imports of U.S. products, in other words, U.S. exports tend to grow, prices of our commodities will be a bit higher there too. So linked not only to the U.S. economy, but other important world economies as well. This is kind of an interesting graph here too, illustrating a few other uh, selected world events maybe is the best way to say it. And, uh, in, and there's a number of different things here that you could uh, plot on this graph. I've just went back and plotted a few things that stuck out in my mind as being influencers in the cattle market that were kind of in that outside market realm of, of things that we typically see in the supply and demand. A couple that really stand out and did have a big influence for a number of years are the case of BSE, um, the first case of BSE in May of 2003 in Canada, and then the, the first one in the United States in December 23rd of 2003. What we saw actually um, following that first case in Canada was an initial drop in the market, both in Canada and the United States. But then as Canada lost its export markets, the U.S. stepped in and uh, serviced a lot of those export markets, drove our cattle prices much, much higher as Canadian cattle prices continued to sink lower and drove our prices much higher as a result. That continued until December of that year when the U.S. had its first case of BSE and ended up losing all of our export markets as well, which ended up dropping uh, cattle prices in the range of about $15 per hundredweight for a while. More recently, you notice there, I, I, I circled the, uh, U, or noted the U.S. recession there, leading up through and including the first part of 2010. That tended to reduce um, um, purchases of beef, and as a result, our uh, prices there uh, in the cattle market were a little bit lower. The Gulf oil spill is noted on there as well as the uh, Japanese earthquake and resulting tsunami there. Um, eventually uh, triggering some increased sales of beef um, following that, uh, that major world event because, um, because of uh, a, a dramatic need for food then at that point, ended up spurring cattle prices uh, higher in the weeks following that. Ultimately saw a bit of a decline though following, uh, following that initial set of purchases as the um, information became uh, 
um, more relevant is the cattle market in terms of some of the nuclear um, and radiation impacts in, in the cattle industry in that particular country. So a lot of things that we're reacting to at that point in time. On a daily basis, you could probably pick out specific events that had some maybe small, maybe sometimes big impacts on, on uh, any of the uh, grain or livestock markets that we look at. These are just a few of the examples though and, and to get a little bit of idea how, how, they, uh, how our prices for our egg commodities have been correlated to some of the outside market influences. With that, I'm Daryl Mark for iGro and uh, we encourage you to turn back into the website to have weekly updates on some of the major influences in the corn and cattle markets in, uh, in that cattle and corn market commentary on iGrow.